Hello, I'm Dr. Philip Boob, and I want to introduce you to Dr. Robert Whitfield. He's in the same building as me, he's right next door, and he's a board certified plastic surgeon. So I want to introduce you to him and let him tell you what he does. Thanks, Dr. Oob. This is my first Facebook Live, so I'm, I'm very excited Dr. Oob brought me in today to do this. Uh, we think we have a, a really good opportunity to blend our practices. Dr. Oob does functional medicine, helping everybody feel better, and one of my goals is uh, to help everybody look better as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about the kind of newer things I have in terms of injectables, both toxins and fillers, and then one of the new and, and most interesting technologies that come along is for skin tightening, and that's using radio frequency. So we'll, we'll start with the toxins and fillers. So everybody's heard about Botox and Dysport. These are, these are substances that we inject and they relax the muscles around the eyes and in the forehead. Um, you can do it in the neck to release bands. So everybody can have a more youthful, more relaxed appearance. We don't do it in a way that's gonna create an unnatural appearance or a frozen forehead or the inability to move your eyebrows. That doesn't look natural, so we don't promote that. Right. Um, additionally, people ask me a lot about fillers. Lip augmentation is a very, very common uh, question I get. What's the best way to do it? I inject with cannulas, so I just make a small uh, incision on the side of the mouth with a little needle and inject through a longer cannula. Hmm. This, for me, it's a little bit simpler. It provides a safer way to distribute product and evenly distribute product without multiple injections. It decreases bruising and swelling, so I like that. Patients, that they, they like it because it's not as hard to then go work the next day or to go an event uh, to an event in a few days. Would you say most other people are just using the needles instead of the cannulas? Yeah, so each company uh, provides uh, needles that you inject with and you can do direct injections. And if I need to fill a certain area after I do the uh, injection with the cannula, I will directly inject that area. If I want to enhance a column, a filtral column, or, or just fill a specific point of the lip, um, I'll do that. The majority of it though I do with um, the cannula. The other more difficult area to inject that I get asked a lot about is around our eyes where we have indents. As we get older, our tissues will descend and we'll get this concavity or a little indent. We'll look, have a bag. And the mistake I see most commonly by um, injectors, they're afraid to inject deep up against the bone and lift the ocular muscle up, which is what eliminates that. Yeah, I'm, it, I'm scared to do that. I, I would never do that. We call it <laughs> trust that guy to do it. Correcting the teardrop. So you just want to find an injector who understands that and is, is able to function and, and do that for you. And then you can have that corrected and that limits people from needing to get blepharoplasty or lower eyelid surgery earlier. So I do a lot less eyelid surgery, a lot less cheek lift surgery than I used to do because of fillers and the use of toxins. Mm -hmm. And so my next kind of most interesting thing is actually skin tightening. And for many, many years we've had devices come along that use radio frequency. They have lots of names but have not had lots of great results so I've never invested in any of them. There's a new technology that's um, bipolar radio frequency. What does that mean? So just like in the operating room we have devices that when you touch it transmits heat through electricity and it shrinks tissue. Mm -hmm. So if you use a unipolar when you touch it it comes through the end into that point and that's where it goes. Bipolar means there's two tips like a tweezer and the current passes between the two tips so it doesn't escape into the rest of the tissue. Oh, I see. So bipolar radio frequency allows you to insert one tip of the probe underneath the skin and one above it okay. and then heat it because each probe has sensors that measure the temperature and then along with the iPhone uh, infrared attachment you can measure the temperature outside so you're heating the skin both above and below and you're helping to in essence you'll melt some of the fat, so you'll reduce the fat, you'll tighten the dermis below, and you'll heat the dermis, I'm sorry, heat the skin above. So we feel like that will give you the most effective, efficient skin tightening. And That's then there's studies. fascinating. Yeah. So wait, there's, there's iPhones involved, there's <laughs> infrared involved, there's electricity involved, it shrinks fat and tightens skin. And you can do it in the office under local anesthesia. And you can walk home after it. Yeah, come in and out. So to me, where I explain it to my patients and I've explained it to Dr. Ube, the bell curve for plastic surgery is really at one end, people who don't want to have anything invasive done. So there's non-invasive treatments. That can be something like cool sculpting or a, uh, a skin treatment. And then there's 
the far end of the bell curve, which is surgery. It's the most invasive, longest recovery period, most financial investment. Everything in the middle is where I feel like the bipolar radio frequency device can help us with skin tightening of the neck, skin tightening of the breast, a skin tightening of the abdomen, uh, loose skin around the thigh, the knee. So this are, these are all areas I've been asked to treat and with open surgery would leave you scarring. This leaves minimal scarring, almost like an IV needle stick mm -hmm. that will heal and become imperceptible with time. If you add other techniques, which is exciting, you can make uh, a combination treatment with the skin tightening and liposuction. So now you enhance the effects of liposuction by adding this technique. And these devices are not available to other practitioners. Only They're only available to board certified plastic surgeons. Too, so I can't do it. That's, that's no. too bad. <laughs> <laughs> so does this replace a facelift or um, anything else? I don't else think it doing? replaces them. I think we can, just like we use toxin and fillers to slow the, the natural aging process, these allow us to now really affect skin and its ability to age differently in different ethnicities, different areas of the body. So for me, it's the most powerful tool that's come across, you know, my plastic surgery, uh, you know, training and practice in the past 20 years. Very cool. Would you say um, how many years would it take off somebody if, if they did the treatments? Well, so the contraction is like you can get up to 30% as the average so I, I feel like, a lot like of years. I feel like in the right age groups you can really impact somebody. So between the third and fifth decade when we're starting to age, women have had pregnancies, they've had weight gain, weight loss. Males have may have weight gain, weight loss, they've had other things. Um, they may just genetically gonna be more susceptible. Neck laxity, uh, eyelid bagging. You can treat the face, the neck. I mean it's a really powerful tool. So one thing I learned when I did a brief Botox training course was that wrinkles can be cured. We love the word cure in medicine. <laughs> we know we rarely get to cure anything. So I was fascinated to learn that wrinkles can be cured. Am I wrong? Was I taught incorrectly? What's your, what's your thoughts on wrinkles can be cured with Botox? So if you start early enough, you won't get the actual line that forms from the activation of the the muscles. I just injected someone yesterday and tried to eliminate this line. It's very difficult once the line forms to eliminate. There are certain injectables that can help you, certain fillers like Velour, um, but it is very hard once you get that deep line. Okay, so it's not always make reversible it go and curable. No. Okay, do I do I have a chance at, at You're curing mine? <laughs> I'm not. I'm I'm done. Yeah. So one thing I do want to address, he's used the word toxin multiple times. And so in functional medicine, I frequently get asked like, well, I want to do this, but it's a toxin. Should I be worried about it? Um, and Botox, while it is called a toxin, it initially killed people because when you consumed Botox, it was in a canned product and you probably right. know other places where people got it, but you consumed a ton. What I learned from my Botox training was you'd have to consume like a million dollars worth of Botox in order to actually get toxic from it. So we use, in functional medicine, we use the word toxin very loosely and we often refer to toxins as in the environment, whether it be a fire retardant or a plastic, whatever it is, we use toxin very loosely. So while Botox is a toxin, it's actually a protein, it's a peptide that's injected under the skin. That's why you can't consume it, you can't rub it on, it must be injected. And that injected toxin gets into the muscle, I think within two or four hours. Right. And once it's into the muscle, it can't go anywhere else in the body. So it's not really a toxin. It doesn't have any preservatives or, or anything else in it that should be toxic. And so many of my patients ask, um, I, I wanna look younger, it, it, this is a toxin, should I do it? And I, I tell them there's, there's no real problem with doing it. Same thing with fillers. Most of the fillers um, are, are collagen based and, and right. many hyaluronic acid, which right. is, a, a so the majority that we already have. The majority I use are hyaluronic acid. So if there's any any issues with them, they're dissolvable. Um, I tend to be very conservative with my injections, so I don't have to dissolve my own fillers. But I've had many many patients refer to me or self refer themselves to have um, their filler dissolved. It's it's just picking your injector properly, having the conversation about what it is, what it will do, where you can put it, how can it be effective, and and the products are very safe. I haven't had injection injuries you just have to know you know where you are anatomically and understand um, I, I think it's a very safe procedure whether you're doing a, a, a Botox or a Dysport injection or a hyaluronic acid uh, filler injection for lip or cheek volume they're all very straightforward and, and easily done.
I'd say a common question I get, and this won't take long to answer, is how often do I need to get Botox, how often do I need to get fillers, and how often would I need to do the skin tightening? So when I do the, the Botox or Dysport injections, every three to four months, I, I have them schedule an appointment, so we'll see what their effect is. Some people will go longer, some people will go shorter. Mm -hmm. um, and then with fillers, it's depending upon the technology of the product you're using. Some will be shorter in duration, so six months. Some will be longer. Uh, 12 months. I usually see my lip augmentation patients because I'm more conservative. Every four to six months, I'll sometimes just touch them up so that they keep the volume they like. Okay, that makes sense. And what about the skin tightening? The skin tightening, we feel like we have a three to five year window. Oh, um, a long time. So I, I feel like depending on your age group, it will dictate your, you know, how we follow that up and what we do next. The treatments can be repeated, but their FDA approval was through one cycle of treatment. I see. Can you briefly touch on the differences between Botox and Dysport? I know a lot of people badmouth one versus the other, Botox being I mean, they're the king both, of the jungle. Yeah, they're both proteins that work. We use them both equally. I've injected the, all my staff and your staff with product, and mm -hmm. uh, it works just fine. Okay. So. And then there, there's even a cheaper one. Uh, I don't have Zeman. Zeman. Uh, so, I, I, I mean, the products work. They're, you know, moxalatum toxin. They're, if you've injected them properly in the right positions, um, it's effective um, beyond that. So what type of fillers do you like to use in the lips? I know a lot of women like the, the full So lips. we have a series of products I use in lips. I use Restylane Silk a lot for volume. Mm -hmm. I use Velbella for volume. And then for fine lines around, we'll use Velbella. And then for uh, these smile lines and activation lines, I'll use Volure to help try to efface those. For volume, you can use Restylane Lift in the cheeks or Voluma in the cheeks, and those are very effective. Um, around the tear trough, the thing I mentioned that you have to be careful with your injector is I use unaltered Restylane for that. So that is more of a short acting, but I like it because it doesn't swell as much. Mm -hmm. And then if you need to correct it, if there's somehow an issue with it, it's easily corrected. Okay, fascinating. Um, I know we're, we're talking a lot about Botox and fillers and kind of non-invasive stuff, but you also do the quote-unquote more invasive things also, sure. right? Sure. Okay. So I do the full spectrum of cosmetic facial, uh, breast, and uh, body contouring, plastic surgery. Um, I just, in terms of what patients really come after right now, the most frequently asked question I get on the uh, websites or through a, uh, a portal is, about Brazilian butt lifts. So the new rage in our country oh, really? is Brazilian butt lifts. And this was about- Men and women or just women? M women. <laughs> um, this was a, a hot topic 10 years ago in South America. And they went through a series of issues where they had people unfortunately die. Oh, and in our country, about. we've faced some of these issues as well. So we've developed a task force through one of the societies I belong to, to help just educate our members, but really picking your provider and picking a board certified plastic surgeon um, to do your case and have you explained uh, properly the risks and benefits of fat grafting, which is what this is. I've done several thousand cases of fat grafting for breast, um, but the most common thing to get asked about right now is for buttock augmentation. Oh, so you can do the fat transfer in the breast too and not, um, they don't so have for, to have implants. Yeah, for fat transfers in breast, it's, it's limited by the the site where you put the fat graft has to accept the volume. So okay. in the buttock, because as we age, we don't do as much uh, muscular activity, so the tone in the muscle goes down, the soft tissues become more lax, the skin becomes more lax. So there's more just sheer area to be able to inject versus mm -hmm. a breast where how tight it is, how much weight loss, weight gain the patients had, what stage in life, how they have pregnancies or not it dictates a lot of what you can do. Mm -hmm. uh, if we've got a postpartum patient, which I just had a, uh, a patient who's unhappy with breast involution after pregnancy. What does that mean, um, breast involution? So they usually go up a couple sizes and then we'll go back down after they complete breast oh, they, don't like, they don't like that. Don't like that. Um, that's the easiest patient to go ahead and correct with the implant and anything above 200 cc's or grams, I recommend an implant because doing fat grafting I think creates it's difficult to get that volume to reside in the breast and be there over the period of the, the time we want it. Okay, so 200 cc's, that doesn't sound like a whole lot. If someone, what's the kind of standard average? Uh, 350. That, 350 is the standard yeah. average. So you're taking an A to a C, a B to a D. Okay. That's about 350. That's what okay. 
you know, and each patient has individual breast characteristics that dictate, you know, what device you want to use. The, the easiest, safest uh, device to use in the patient who's a, a seeking aesthetic enhancement um, is a smooth, round implant. There'll be less issues with um, potentially, hopefully, capsular contracture if all the appropriate uh, precautions are taken. And then if there's any change in the um, position of the implant, it's round. So you, you won't see a conformational change in the breast. You'll just it'll move around in the pocket. The best thing is to have a hand and glove fit for the pocket. You don't need a, a wide pocket. You don't want the breast to be mobile outside of its uh, placement. So you don't want separation when the patient lies down. That's not a natural appearance. Uh, that was more something taught in the 80s and early 90s. But oh, really? um, these days we want a hand and glove fit. There's a 14 point plan adopted across the world about how to address implant safety when placement of an implant is performed in the operating room and what steps to take to help avoid contamination and prevent hopefully long-term problems with capsular contracture and then other inflammatory processes that lead to lymphoproliferative disorders as like uh, ALCL. Can you briefly touch on um, the safety of implants as far as their toxin load or are there bad implants, bad manufacturers with heavy metals and toxins and stuff in it? Yeah, this has been an interesting uh, <laughs> thing for me over the last couple of years I've become known in the area of uh, Texas really as somebody who will treat patients with breast implant related illness which is not a formal diagnosis that you can find in a book but it certainly has a, a lot of indictments for and, and problems suggestive of implant uh, and how it reacts with the, that particular patient. Now it's not going to happen in every patient but right. patients who have hips and knees have these problems as well. Um, I've seen all sorts of issues over many, many years, but I've had patients recently come to me and seek me out for removal of their implants with their capsules, and I've done cultures and looked at specimens in each of these patients, and many of them have had underlying infections. So, so bacterial to, infections? Yeah. So do you really think it's the implant, or do you think it's more poor surgery, lack of sterility? So I think that onus always falls on the, the surgeon technically whether they're putting in a hip or a knee or a breast implant is their technique so once I mentioned a 14 point plan for safety but it's adopted around the world by many of us and how you um, address the surgery what precautions you take to protect the skin from the implant so the implant does not go through insertion and touch the skin which can colonize the bacteria especially sure. a textured implant um, because of the surface area, the increased uh, texture increases surface area. area. Okay. So we, I feel like that's a major component of this. So in my in my own practice, uh, in the last uh, five years, we looked up. I've had one patient with a capsular contraction and my capture. That's the second time you said. I have no idea what that means. Capture so hard scar. Ah, hard scar around the implant. Okay. And then in my reconstructive practice. I've had two patients in the last five years have a capsular contracture. And about how many do you do in five years? Too many. <laughs> a lot, okay. So overall, I think, you know, many of us have had, had adopted these principles over time, but there's such a large number of providers who do breast enhancement surgery across the world. There's no good way to standardize everybody's sure, technique. Sure. In our country, we've, we, I think we've tried very hard through meetings and education to, to do that. Are there any specific implants that you should we should tell people like oh don't use this brand? I'm no, sure. no. In terms of brands, there's really three brand, three vendors in the country: Sientra, uh, there's Allergan, and there's Mentor. Mentor's here in Texas. I've used all of them. Um, I've used all of them for cosmetics and not had issues with them. I used all of them for reconstruction, and I personally not have had uh, have had issues with textured implants uh, from the reconstructive standpoint. But there have been people have issues with textured implants. So those are the most concerning. Any vendor with any texturing is, is you know, more of the concern. In my cosmetic patients, always smooth, always round, and that limits malposition, um, you know, like I said, conformational changes, and just, I haven't had problems with capture contracture, so. Okay. And so I was, that I didn't know that. So you do explants also. Um, when, whenever you're doing explanting, especially if you're worried about small bacterial infections or chronic infections, do you put implants back in at the same time or usually when you're explanting, you're just completely removing? So the patients who seek out uh, explantation for breast implant related illness 
I tell them across the board I will not re-implant them at that time. And if they ask me to do fat grafting to replace volume, I say I will not do that at that time. I've had too many patients sequentially have infections. So you would really? never want to put fat graft in an environment where you know or potentially have a bacterial infection because that will then you know, uh, harm the graft or its ability to take. And maybe you have good tick on one side and not on the other, and then mm -hmm. you're, you have that battle. Or you, you have a almost like a Petri dish for mm -hmm. the the bacteria. So I've told them just to wait at six months, reevaluate, and if they're infection free and everything's fine, then consider it. Fat grafting. Many of them just want nothing to do with implants anymore, which I understand. That's reasonable. And so um, I haven't had that. If I have people come who just want a revision because they're unhappy with their implants, then of course we take a different tact with that and we'll explant them and re-implant them. Okay, fascinating. Well, I feel like I learned a lot already. Is there anything, <laughs> any other topics we need to hit real quick? <laughs> Well, I think, it, you know, to summarize, I think injectables and fillers, I, I do my own injections, so I think that's important. I know in yeah, Austin absolutely. there's many mid-level providers doing them, but I do my own. So tell me, what, what does that mean, tell people? So if you get Botox, what the, so how can if, you tell if the difference? Getting, um, the injections, like, for me, I've operated on every aspect of the face, so it's not a difficult uh, issue for me to place product exactly where I want to put it. If I'm not afraid to put the product underneath your muscle, underneath your or around your eye because I've taken that apart in an operation a million times and put it back together. So it's nothing phases me or concerns me about where or the level or depth of a, a product placement. And um, I, I don't I don't feel like injections should be stressful for the patients. You should tell mm -hmm. them you know what's what's going on. Provide you know topical anesthetic, and if they need more, we give them more. We have a little fancy massager so it takes kind of their mind off of it and it should be done quickly and efficiently it shouldn't be a big deal shouldn't be a lot of stress afterwards although it, anything can be anxiety provoking but sure. I can do them you know safely and efficiently and quickly in the office and get them in and out and the and the the fancy thing for us you know coming along to, to put everything together is the skin tightening I, I haven't actually been excited about anything as much in plastic surgery the last 20 years as I have about these new devices so very looking forward cool. to it very cool. Well, hopefully you'll post some cases. I know we have to be careful with HIPAA, but we you'll will. you'll have some we photos will. and things. Well, tell people really quickly, where, where can they find you, Dr. Whitfield? So we have three locations. We are here with Dr. Oob in uh -huh. Westlake Hills, and mm -hmm. then we're in Suite 2, uh, I'm sorry, Suite 380 <laughs> in Lakeway um, near Baylor Scott White Hospital. And then I have an uh, office in Round Rock on Wyoming Springs. Okay. Where can people find you online? So, launching the first week of November will be my website, drrobertwhitfield.com. Otherwise, you can okay. find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Okay. Do you have a Facebook name? It's just Robert Whitfield. Dr. Dr. Robert Whitfield. Okay. And we'll post those links in the comment after we're done with the video. Anything else you want to add, Dr. Whitfield? So. All right. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. Hopefully, this was informative to you guys. Um, like and share the video with anybody else that you, you might think is interested in cosmetics and aesthetics. Thank you again, Dr. Whitfield.